started. Welcome, everybody. Start with uh, introducing the presenters here. Benjamin Sears and Bradford Connor have been performing together since 1989 and have participated in conferences on Broadway, Hollywood, and the Great American Songbook. They have the distinction of premiering works by Irving Berlin and George Nyer Gershman. They're producing directors of American classics and are founding members of the Boston Association of Cabaret Artists, an organization promoting awareness and performance of cabaret in the Boston area. Sears and Connor are known for their research in the music and lyrics of Tin Pan Alley, Broadway, and Hollywood. Ben's first book, The Irving Berlin Reader, was published by Oxford University Press in April 2012. He has a forthcoming chapter for a Wizard of Oz book published by OEP as well. Brad is editing the new edition of the classic American popular song, 1900-1950 by Alec Wilder. They've also restored and produced the only revival of Yip Yip Yang Hang. I'm uh, Yap Hang, the source, <laughs> <laughs> the source of today's lecture recital. Jeffrey McGee teaches and writes about music in the United States, especially jazz, musical theater, and popular song. His interests include a variety of African American traditions, issues of Jewish American musical identity, and black Jewish intersections. He's the author of the award-winning books The Uncrowned King of Swing, Fletcher Henderson and Big Band Jazz, and Irving Berlin's American Musical Theater. His book in progress, Gypsy in the American Dream, is under contract with OUP. Professor McGee has published pro prolifically in many journals and has given, lecture recital, or, um, given public lectures at the Library of Congress, Harvard University, 92Y, and several other colleges and universities. His voice may be heard on the documentary series Leonard Bernstein in American Life, narrated by Susan Sarandon and widely aired on public radio, and he has been interviewed by the New York Times and Al Jazeera America. His forthcoming articles in all Sondheim and all Hamilton issues of studies in musical theater. Please welcome Ben Bradford and Jeffrey in revisiting Irving Berlin's Yip 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 Hey. <laughs> Thank you. 
In that song from 1915, Irving Berlin portrays ragtime as a unifying force in which a persona dreams of a ball where Euro European royals celebrate in cooperation and peace. Just over a decade earlier, ragtime had been a controversial idiom, to some a bracing new indigenous style, to others a scourge on the American musical landscape. For Berlin, it was an all-American style that brought the nation's diverse population together and served as a force for peace around the world. Of course, by the time he wrote that song, the, the world was already at war, so its vision could only be a dream. Berlin wrote many other songs about the Great War, including an entire Broadway review about its impact on soldier and civilian life, and we'll hear several of those today. Music and war have a complicated relationship. Music can inspire, inspire action, offer solace, and honor the dead. It can also increase tensions and speak truth to power. With the assistance of amplification, it can even be weaponized. It can also divert attention from death and destruction in order to entertain. While doing that, it can also create a bond between performers and audiences and raise money for a good cause. Such is the case with Irving Berlin's songs from his All Soldier Wartime Review, Yip Yip Yapnik, which premiered in August of 1918. So one century ago this month, Irving Berlin stood on the cusp of a career change. He had just become a US citizen on February 6th, 1918, and just before the turning age 29, he was drafted into the Army soon after. By this time, he had already achieved international renown as the writer of Alexander's Ragtime Band and several other hit songs since his breakout year of 1919 with such songs as Sadie Salome, Go Home. He had also made his mark on Broadway with several numbers for the Ziegfeld Follies and his first show, Watch Your Step, an on-the-town escapade featuring the latest dance phrases modeled by Vernon and Irene Castle and a crowd-pleasing opera spoof. Now, as a celebrity soldier, he was stationed at Camp Upton in Yaphank, Long Island. As he reported later, he hated many aspects of army life, especially reveling. But as Berlin had done before, he turned privation into opportunity and convinced his commanding officer that he could best realize his patriotic duty by writing a camp show featuring the soldiers around him. For that, he was given the rank of sergeant and the right to sleep in as long as he wished. <laughs> Yip Yip Yap Hank conceived and developed at Camp Upton in the summer of 20, uh, 1918, established the style and structure of a show he would create during World War II. This is the Army. And his catalyst for this one was the challenge of fusing Army content with show business conventions. Hatched in the heyday of the review, the World War I show reflected the review's impulse to adopt and parody aspects of current music and theater while being unified around a central topical theme, the US Army and the common soldier's experience. In this show, Berlin discovered the musical theater in Army life, a discovery that would continue to resonate in his work for decades in, in This is the Army and in the films Alexander's Ragtime Band and even White Christmas. The show was billed as a military mess cooked up by the boys of Camp Upton in aid of the fund to establish a community house at Camp Upton for the wives, mothers, and sweethearts who visit their boys at camp. Yip Yip Yapank ran for just 32 performances, but although the run was brief by Broadway standards, it actually had to be extended from the limited eight performance run that had been planned. This was a remarkable achievement for a show in the Century Theater, a massive house with more than 2,300 seats. The show succeeded beyond expectation, earning a reported $50,000 from its packed houses by September 1 alone. So our goal today is to recapture some of the excitement of the show with several songs that Berlin wrote for it and a few war-related songs that he wrote in that period aside from the show. The presentation will contain 10 more songs and we'll do it in three sets, with, um, starting with a three song set from Yip Yip Yap. Kitchen Police is a comical lament in which Berlin himself appeared as a lowly private 
together with some cross-dressed uh, soldiers. Um, this is one of the conventions of minstrelsy that was a common element in this show. We frequently have the soldiers dressing up in a variety of, of ways, including uh, as women. <clears throat> the next one in this set, Sterling Silver Moon, is a courtship and wedding song for the show's first part which comprise an entire sort of mini minstrel show, complete with soldiers choruses, the soldier chorus on risers and the end men in blackface. The song was revised and revived as Mandy for the 19, 19 Ziegfeld Follies, a major production in that show, and as such appeared 35 years later in the film White Christmas. The last number in the set that to follow was the show's act one finale. Send a lot of jazz bands over there, merge the country's newly exportable musical style and its army's mission, with a nod to George Jeff Cohen's recent hit, Over There, and an exhortation to the president, Mr. Wilson. Here, jazz, like ragtime before it, is an idiom that emerged from African American culture that now serves as an agent of bonding and morale boosting for the Allied cause in France. So if Ben is going to sing the Irving Berlin part, I'm sorry I left my dress at home. <laughs> <laughs>
soldier to which civilians could relate, having to clean the kitchen, getting wrenched out of bed too soon, finding solace in a safe haven for R&R, &R, facing rigid rules with nimble wit, and dreaming of the girl left behind. In fact, a common thread in almost all of Irving Berlin's war-related songs is a unique angle that captures army life in a way that resonates as widely as possible. And of course, all are shaped by the gendered, heterosexual norms of the sheet music industry's products. Our next set features three songs that preceded Yap Hank by several months, each creating a comic or poignant self-contained story. They were all out of step, but Jim voices two parents' misplaced pride in their soldier boy who cannot seem to synchronize in marching formation. <laughs> I'm going to pin a medal on the girl I left behind, caps into a decades old and newly popular girl I left behind trope that many war period songs reflect, sometimes with comic effect, like this other one, Not by Berlin. The girl I left before I left the girl I left song Berlin wrote in the summer of 17 addresses such a girl directly in what might be called, what might be called an advice number. The unnamed persona notices the girl looks sad and the chorus becomes the advice to quote, smile and show your dimple, you'll find it's very simple. Sixteen years later, as many of you know, Berlin recycled part of the melody and rewrote the lyrics as in your Easter bonnet with all the frills upon it to create one of his enduring standards. Easter Parade, and of course 15 years after that, in 1948, it gave its title to the famous Fred Astaire, Judy Garland movie. Uh, we'll move on to our next set. Also point out that uh, they were all out of step, but Jim is, is un-PC. So get ready. Yes. <laughs> Stop. 
talking terribly loud. Twenty times he treated my, but he was dry. When his glass was empty, he would treat again and cry. Did you see me, little Jimmy Marchin, with the soldiers up the avenue? There was Jimmy just as stiff and stout.
of songs from Yip Yip Yapang, it's worth remembering that military camp shows were nothing new. Thousands of soldiers created and performed in ad hoc minstrel shows, vaudevilles, reviews, and musical comedies in both world wars. But for the most part, sh shows never went beyond their home camps. So a soldier show on Broadway required an imaginative leap, or it would be inv inevitably be compared with others. Indeed, an all-soldier show uh, might have a seemed a contradiction in terms, given the reviews this time in the review's heyday. Unlike most reviews, most notably the Ziegfeld Follies, Yapeng could not depend on stars or feminine display. Yet the New York Times viewed the largely amateur cast as, quote, an immeasurable advantage over the commercial musical show, unquote. Moreover, two shows staged earlier in 1918 that paved the way for Berlin's undertaking, a musical comedy called Goodbye Bill, created and performed by the U.S. Army Ambulance Corps, and Biff Bang, the review staged by a naval training camp in Helen, New York. Both shows received strong reviews, and the Times even went so far as to claim in spring of 1918 that, quote, these service shows are the high spot of the past year of musical entertainment, unquote. Still, most of Berlin's cast members were amateurs. Simon Silver did Silverman of Variety noted that with awe, that of all these 350 boys, not over 20 ever appeared on the professional stage before. It's only show people who can fully appreciate what that means, unquote. Our final sequence contains one of Berlin's all-time greatest hits and builds to the show's finale. It begins with a lullaby, and I don't have a sheet music cover for this one, but I can title. Picturing a lullaby picturing a sleeping soldier, dream on little soldier boy, with lyrics by Gene Schwartz, a rare instance after the early teens of Berlin collaborating with another lyricist. He wrote the music. That this number refers to Reveille plants the seed for the song to follow, Oh, How I Hate to Get Up in the Morning. <laughs> this whimsical complaint in the style of a quick step march boasts a string of comic violent hyperbole, as in the line, someday I'm going to murder the bugler, someday they're gonna find him dead, I'll amputate his reveille and step upon it heavily and spend the rest of my life in bed. Sorry guys, so okay. the punchline. Uh. <laughs> this was Berlin's signature song in both wars, tightly bound to his stage persona and his light rough textured, what he called, whiskey voice. So from there, the now awakened soldier uh, <laughs> finds solace and refuge in the YMCA. Then we close with the show's finale, we're on our way to France. In this stirring march, a large cast in uniform filed off the stage, down the aisles, and out into the street as if fulfilling the song's charge. So powerful was its impact that Berlin insisted on commemorating this scene twice on film. First, in Alexander's Ragtime Band of 1938, and then again in This is the Army, the 1943 film based on the World War II review that he had built on the foundation of Yip Yip Yapang. Although Yip Yip Yapang ran only 32 performances, its concept and numbers like the ones we're about to hear, continue to resonate on stage and screen for decades to come. And I'll let these guys take it. So if he's gonna steal our punchline, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll tell you about the hats. This hat is a World War I authentic hat. It was born in the battlefield. Um, you can even see the splotches on it. It was decommissioned. The way they did that was they stamped on the top and on the brim. So, in fact, this probably saw active duty. We also have a pickle halibut at home, but we weren't going to bring that on the plane. <laughs> but meanwhile, Ben's hat is fake. <laughs> I'm just a singer. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Irving Berlin was always very involved in the political scene. Um, he, uh, when Germany was getting ready to invade Belgium, he actually wrote a song about called The Voice of Belgium, and boom, it happened. In World War II, in 1938, 39, he wrote a song called When That Man Is Dead and Gone. It was all about Hitler. And he was saying the US needs to get in there before this gets worse. And of course, we didn't listen to it. <laughs> um, but in any case, we had this one number that we were uh, debating, and we love this cover. <laughs> um, the devil has bought up all the coal, and it's Irving Berlin's comment on the coal shortage and why it was happening in Germany. It's and in the US too, everywhere. Right. Everyone's hollering. 